Our first song will be Lord Reign in Me.
our call to worship this morning will be from Psalm 95. I'm reading verse 1 and 2 and then 6 and 7. Psalm 95, verse 1 and 2 and then 6 and 7. In the New King James Version, the Bible says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. And verse 6 and 7 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Amen. Amen.
Today's scripture reading is found in Genesis 3, verses 1 to 10. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 10. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden of Eden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat it, and nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed big leaves together and made themselves covered. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. May God have a blessing to the reading of his word. I know we have much to be thankful for, and I also know that we have requests, petitions of our Father. And so, God sees your heart, and He knows that. But we will just raise both hands to show that we do have much thankfulness to God and we have requests. Thank you. As far as possible, can we kneel for prayer? Of eternal life. We thank you so much 
And we say to you this morning, dear Father, that words are not enough. And so we give ourselves to you anew today to show how much we are thankful to you. And we pray and we thank you that you will keep us in safety in your hands until the day that Jesus returns. We think today of those who are grieving for the death of their loved ones, especially those who are grieving for the sudden deaths that they have suffered in their families. We think especially of those in Colorado, and we know that, Father, you have put your loving arms around those who have been left behind to be read. And we thank you so much that you have also put it into the hearts of the other citizens in that place to help those who are grieving. We are far away, but we think about them. We thank you, Father, that you have given us hearts of love so that we can feel compassion for others. We think today of those on our prayer list, those who are sick, those who cannot come out to church. And we give a special thank you to, to those who in our congregation have been able to visit and provide food for them. We thank you, Father, that you have given us different gifts. Help us to treasure them and to use them for the purpose for which they were intended, which is the equipping of the church. We thank you, Father, this morning <clears throat> for our pastor and his family. We pray that as he speaks your word today, we will learn something more about temptation and we will realize more fully that we do not need to fall into temptation because you have provided a way of escape for us. We think today of our church in the Philippines that our women's ministry is sponsoring. We thank you that so many more members have been coming out to church. And we thank you for the strength and the courage that you have given that minister to continue sharing your gospel, even in times when it's not so easy. We pray that today you will continue to be with our young people, or youth, or young adults, or children in our midst. May they look around and see that the life of Christ is being lived out in those of us who are older, so that they will be able to emulate us as we emulate Christ. And Father, may it be that this church here in this part of the city will be what you say we should be, a light and salt of the earth, so that we can help in the preservation of souls. Grant us what we ask for today, because we ask it all in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen.
will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things. We have an abundance for every good work. Second Corinthians 9 verses 6 to 8. What a wonderful lesson from the Bible. We read what we saw. Each person is to give as the purpose in their heart. Each must decide individually whether or not to give of our offerings and ourselves to Christ. God wants us to give our life back to Him because we love Him. He doesn't want he does not want us to do it grudgingly or of necessity. That is because we think we have to. We don't have to. God is able to supply all our spiritual and material needs as we follow Him. The evil one will use any method he can, he can to keep us from beginning to give and to stop our present giving. He doesn't care how he prevents giving as long. He doesn't care how he presents giving as long as he sees he so take take root, flourish and bear fruit of disunity, bitterness and self interest. The motive for giving is love. Love alone will recognize the need. We cannot pass by a need. Love then is demonstrated by a tangible response. And uh, the appeal, our offering today is for the special needs of our conference. As we give, let entertain the question, do we really honestly love? We may not know until tested by sacrifice. I would like to ask the deacons and deaconesses to please serve us.
Loving Father, thank you for the care and the guidance you have provided us. And thank you also, Lord, for our safety, Lord. And thank you for giving us the Sabbath day. And Lord, bless our guests with love today and help us in our service fully. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And it's uh, for the children's time. And I would like to remind the kids to please come here slowly. No running, please. And uh, the children's story will be given to us by Sister Riley Morales.
and it takes a long time. <laughs> then we wouldn't really be able to break a nail because if you're going to break the sticks, you get, you're going to have to break a nail, and who can break a nail with their bare hands? Uh, any of you? <laughs> Besides him. <laughs> okay, so that means that with you can't break the sticks because you have the nail inside it and it's tightly wrapped together with the nail. So this rubber band, the one that tied the sticks together, represents our faith. And we get our faith from regular study of the Bible and from prayer to God. Faith binds us to Jesus, and we, when we are always close to him, just as the sticks are to the nails, we can, go, we can go through troubles easily because God's on our side. So whatever things that hit us, whether it be uh, bad grades in school, or somebody picked on you, or some or you lost something important to you, God will be always on your side no matter what. So I think the disciples were kind of sad because they felt like with Jesus not on their side, they felt like they couldn't really do anything. But as long as they kept their faith and stayed close with the nail, or, or, or Jesus, or sent by the nail, and wrapped their faith around them, they could remain faithful to him. So the verse, um, there's a verse that comes from Hebrews 10, 23, and if you can help me memorize it, hold fast the profession of your faith. Here, I'll say it again. Hold fast the profession of your faith. So it basically means keep your faith no matter what hard times can come that will come across. You may now go back to your seats.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're supposed to be happy today. Right? Thank you, Donna and me, for that beautiful song. I love that song. Uh, one more time, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all our visitors that have come to join us in our worship this uh, Sabbath morning. Thank you very much. We are so happy to have you. And a uh, special welcome to our CYC. CYC. These are group of student couple tours. They are here in the city of Winnipeg for the whole summer, I guess. And uh, I believe that uh, one of these days they will come and visit your your home. So, if that would be the case, then I would like to ask you to be very kind to them, open your doors, and uh, you know they will be distributing our magazines, health magazines, and religious books. So, if you will be buying some of these uh, magazines and books, you will be helping them build up their scholarship, to score their their school expenses. And so, please be very kind to them. Open your doors, welcome them. If you are eating, you you invite them for. <laughs> so how many of you are here? Fourteen. So fourteen of our students from different schools are here visiting every home trying to distribute our books and magazines to the people of the city of Winnipeg. So our sermon this morning is how temptation works. Now there was a minister who went to visit a parishioner who had not attended church for several weeks. Seeing her car parked in the driveway, the minister knew that the lady must be home. And so he knocked on the door, but there was no response from the inside. The minister walked around the side of the house towards the, the back. The radio was on, and by the poolside, he found an empty chair, a half-finished glass of iced tea, a piece of bread, and of course the radio was on, but the parishioner was not around. And so determined to give her a lecture on the evils of choosing and bathing over church attendance, he called her name several times through the back door, but nobody answered. So at this point, the minister took his pen, a piece of business card, and a little bit annoyed, he wrote several lines from Isaiah 65, verse 12. It says, I called you, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not listen. You did evil in my silence. Choose what this pleases me. Then what he did, he stuck this note in the crack of the door and went away. The next morning, the minister arrived at the church office. He was surprised to see a note from the lady whom he visited a day before. And the note simply read, Dear Pastor, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, yours truly. And so Pastor has this message. The, the, the minister opened his Bible on Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. And then he read, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. <laughs> let's, let's read our passage one more time. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and 10. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. 
you will not serve daily lives who have been sent to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for getting wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Shall we bear it to praise? Father in heaven, as we now consider this passage, it's a very important passage, Lord. We would like to ask that you please come with us. May you grant us wisdom, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord, about the real meaning of this passage. And please help me now for this I ask in Jesus' name. <laughs> now friends, the book of Genesis tells us where we came from. It also tells us we are and it tells us where we are and what went wrong. And it is in this information, it is in this passage that explains for all the tensions between nations around the world. We have here the answer to the eternal why that arises in our hearts in times of tragedy and in times of grief. We have here the ultimate explanation of human heartaches, misery, torture, and tears. Here in this passage, we find the explanation for all the hardships and struggles that we experience today. It is here where we find the explanation why we act the way we do, why we are so self-centered and mindless of others' needs. And most striking thing about this chapter is that we find ourselves here. You cannot read through the story of the fall without feeling that you have lived it yourself. Because the account of the temptation and the fall is reproduced or duplicated in our lives many times a day. I don't know if you remember the story about a little boy who got an order from the father that he should not be swimming in the irrigation canal. The father says, son, don't swim in the irrigation canal. And the, and the, and the son said, okay, dad. But when the boy came home, he was carrying a wet swimming trunk. And the father asked, where have you been? And the boy answered and said, swimming in the canal. The father said, did I not tell you not to swim there? And the boy said, yes, dad. Then why did you swim, the father asked. The boy said, well, dad, I had my swimming suit with me. I couldn't resist the temptation. Well, why did you take your swimming suit with you, the father questioned. And the boy said, so I would be prepared to swim in case I am tempted. <laughs> we all heard the voice of the tempter. We all felt the drawing of sin and we all, we all know the times of guilt that follow. Many friends, we all become victims of temptations. The story of the temptation and the fall occurred to us many times. We hardly could escape repeating it. I can say, friends, that Genesis chapter 3 is the most up-to-date and very appropriate to us. And so this morning we're going to look into it very carefully. The first person or the first person that we meet here 
It's not Adam and Eve, but it's the tempter, right? We have some important, important things to say about the, about the, the serpent. It says, now this serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Look at how the serpent was introduced. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. The Hebrew word for serpent is nakas, which means to shine. So the noun for this word is the shining one. And if we try to substitute this with its true meaning and try to read it, it would say, now the shining one was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Listen to what the spirit of prophecy tells us about the serpent. It says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53, the serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on earth. It had wings, and while flying through the air, it presented an appearance of brightness, having the color and brilliancy of burnished gold. It was an object to arrest the attention and delight the eye of the beholder. I'm sure you know what Paul speaks of a serpent in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 40. Paul says that the devil appears to us and as a what? As an angel of light. So the Nakash, the serpent or the shining one who came to it, he was the ancient serpent, the devil, who appears as an angel of light. It was glorious to behold. No wonder, friends, why Eve was attracted to it. And then we are told that he was more subtle than any other creature, meaning he was what? He was crafty and cunning. You know, Martin Luther says about the serpent on earth is not equal. No man is able to admit the devil. And the devil knows for sure that the woman was created with a more emotional character than we men. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, ladies. <laughs> but let me explain this. When God created woman, the woman, when God created you, ladies, He got one of the ribs of Adam, right? Now, what do you think is the reason behind this? Is this because the reed is a curved bone so that women will have more curves? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Ribs are the closest to the heart. Therefore, it is closely linked with the heart, which is the center of emotional life. So that God took one of the ribs closest to the heart because he wanted the woman to be more emotional in order to be a perfect companion of man. Psychologists today confirm this idea. Tears, fears, cheers come more easily to women than they do to men. It is the emotional nature which adds color and warmth to life. Let me explain this some more. For example, your dog has bitten a neighbor's child. Now, which would you talk to or whom would you talk to? The mother of the child or the father? Hmm? <laughs> if you are thinking good, you would approach the mother. Right? You know, when I was thinking to, to court my wife, I approached the mother. Because, you know, she stayed at the girl's door. And, and, and the 
the lady student was very strict. When she would see you there three times or four times, she would come to you and then would ask you if you are courting anybody. And of course, I was very honest. And I said, yes. But then she said, are we not allowing you to come the fourth time without any permission from the parents of the staff? Is that clear? Yes. And so I went to the place, you know, to, 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 to the place of Estella, and I approached the mom. Because I, I'm sure that if I will approach the father and tell him of my purpose to his, to his daughter, then I, I, I'm very sure he would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but when I asked permission, permission from, the, from the mom, all she said, oh, that's a very lovely way of putting my bed. Okay, no more, I'll give you the, I'm giving you the permit. No, there is something intrinsic to the nature of women which makes them most approachable and unfortunately often more easily manipulated. And the devil knows that they are easier to manipulate by emotional appeals. That's why he waited for the best opportunity. And that moment came when Eve got up from Adam's side. So here we see the craftiness of the devil from the beginning. He never appears to be a bad guy, but always come as a good guy, a shining being of wholesome character and benevolent in purpose. And the strategy that he used with him is exactly the same strategy that he employs when he comes to you and me. Basically, he would come as, a, as an angel of light. Look at this. Desire of ages when Jesus was tempted in the garden of Gethsemane. It says here, he came to the Savior as if in answer to his one prayer. One in the guise of an angel from heaven and with a divine mission to deliver him. This is his old crafty strategy and most of the time he is very successful in tempting us because of this. He comes as an angel of light. Satan approached Eve in an apparently friendly manner. Yes, of course, there are times he would come as a roaring lion, right? He comes to strike fear in the heart so he can destroy us. But most often, he will come to us as a good God. This is his most successful style. This was what he did with Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, friends, the only difference between us and Eve was that for Eve, she was innocent and the tempter was outside trying to reach her mind and thoughts. But with us, we must understand that since the fall, the tempter is within us. And he has all the access to us so that we are never out of reach of temptation. What I mean is that we are always exposed to him wherever we are or whatever we are doing. He always has an access to us. When we go shopping, he allures us to buy some things that we could hardly afford so that we are always short of money, and when we go to church, we have nothing to eat. <laughs> the devil approaches us in the same three stages outlined by James. Look at this. In James 1, chapter 4, covers verses 14 to 15. It says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to what? To death. James tells us that the first tactic of Satan when he tempts us is to come to us and arouse the desire. To do this. Every man is tempted when he is lured and enticed 
by his own desire. So he first arouses our desire to do wrong. He creates a hunger or he lures us towards evil. Take note of how he cunningly moves to arouse within the heart of Eve. It says in Genesis 3 verses 1 to 5, look at the question. He said, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You take note of how he used the name of God. He used Elohim instead of the name of God, Yahweh. Why did he do that? Because, you know, Yahweh, it means or it implies a loving and a personal God. But with Elohim, the name Elohim describes the position of God. Imagine, imagine like when you call your, your spouse, hey wife, hey husband, you, you call your spouse like that? <laughs> It's time for dinner, husband. No, we we call them what? Sweetheart? Darling? Come on dear, it's time for dinner. You know, those 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 terms are more intimate, more personal than calling your your spouse husband, wife. No, we don't. The name of God, Yahweh, is more personal than the name of and one thing more. In the first chapters of Genesis, the, the name of God that has been used in these first chapters is Yahweh. It's only the serpent when he came in and used the name Elohim. Now step number one was that he made the woman want to sin. He needs to do this because originally Eve did not feel any wrong desire within her. So he had to arouse her desire to want to sin. It is the task of the serpent to awaken a wrong desire in the heart of the woman. And the opportunity he had was provided by the gift of free will. But with us friends, to arouse the desire to sin is not very difficult because we respond readily to such desire. There is also an urge, there is always an urge within us to do wrong. Theologians, they call it, we have the propensity to what? To sin. Although we were given the freedom of choice, it is easier for us to do wrong than to do good. The Lord knows that. But we must be able to respond voluntarily to Him. This freedom of choice is the greatest gift ever given to mankind. God will never violate this. He doesn't coerce us. He doesn't force us to be right. We have the right to reject His love and the right to turn off His grace. We have the right to refuse His mercy and go our own stubborn way. In fact, the reason why the tempter was given access to the Garden of Eden was that men be given the chance to choose to love God or to go the other direction. Free will is that which makes us men. But on the other hand, this is also what makes us temptable. And when Jesus became a man like us, he too was exposed to the power of Satan to take. Now take note of how the devil aroused the desire of the woman to do wrong. The first thing was that he implanted distrust in the heart of Eve. Distrust to God's love. He raised the question, did God say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did you notice that he focused on the prohibition and that on the and not on the boundaries that they, have, have, that they can have in the garden. Because God said you can eat any of the fruit of the tree in the garden. But the tempter, he focused on the prohibition. He said, the, 
God say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? As if he was saying, could God have said a thing like that? Are you sure? Did you really know God that well? Do you think God really loves you? And that he would say that kind of a thing? Asking you not to eat of a tree in the garden? You know, with such a question, he is planting a seed of doubt in the woman's heart. In a certain way, he is implying that God's prohibition is unreasonable. He is saying that God is unfair. He is seeking to alter the image of God in her thinking. And while pretending to be compassionate and friendly toward him, Satan is actually putting a seed of doubt in her heart. I don't know, friends, but maybe... You have heard the question of Satan lately in your life. Can a God who loves you forbid such a thing as this? Can a loving God allow you to suffer? Can a loving God allow you all these pains and sufferings? And you know, friends, the response of the woman was perfectly forthright, right? Look at Genesis 3 verses 2 and 3. We, the woman said, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Did God say that they don't touch anything? They don't touch the fruit? No, no he didn't say that. You know, there's some, there's some, who accused the woman of adding to what God has said when he said, neither shall you touch it. Because that's not a part of the prohibition in verse 17. But, but I think we don't need to view it that way. To me, I believe that the woman is just giving a fuller account of what God has said. God was simply saying, look, this tree is harmful and therefore don't get close to it. Don't expose yourselves to its temptation. Remember when the Lord taught his disciples how to pray? He said, lead us not into what? Into temptation. He didn't say, he didn't say, lead us out of temptation once we've gotten into it. No, it doesn't say that way. But he said, lead us not into temptation, because by the time we've gotten into temptation, listen to this, we are already half lost. Mm -hmm. Someone has said that the thing that makes both men and rivers crooked is that they both follow the line of least resistance. This is the point for temptations always come to us. The line of least resistance. Now the tempter moves quickly to the next step. Having, having gained Eve's attention to trust, he delivers a knockout blow. Satan directly and emphatically denies God's word. Look at this. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Hmm. He now tells openly the results that will occur. He said, you shall not surely die. Take note of his cleverness. Satan is clearly telling him that God is a liar. And that his word cannot be trusted. As if he was saying, it will not, it will not happen as God said. Don't take God seriously. This is no big deal. It can be that important. It's not a matter of life and death. God is a God of love. He won't let you die. You know, friends, Satan's great lie said, the opposite of God's law is freedom. And the opposite of disobedience to God is blessing. You know, the best way to get people to rebel against God's word is first to get them to disbelieve it and then get them to believe that it is false. 
You try to go to the internet. Listen to the manner in which theological liberals, secular humanists, and even militant homosexuals and radical feminists speak about God's word. You can hear them say what? They are mimicking Satan's word. They teach that the Bible is a myth. That it is all lies. That God's word is not relevant today. Listen, friends, this belief and this trust of God's word is the starting point of all sin and rebellion. Did you get that? I want to repeat that. This belief and this trust of God's word is the starting point of all sin and rebellion. Eve's decision to forsake God's word and do her own faith involved unbelief. Eve knew God's word. She clearly had an understanding of God's prohibition. Her problem was not a lack of understanding, but a lack of trust. Eve did not believe God's word. She did not have faith in God. If Eve really believed God's word, she would not have placed it on the same level as Satan's word. Look at this, friend. Unbelief is the fountain from which springs all sin and rebellion. A sincere Christian does not disbelieve God's word. He doesn't attempt to refute it for the sake of sinful pleasure. And then after telling Eve that God is alive, that sin will not result in death, Satan now explains why God has lied and why Eve will not die. Because he said, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan told Eve that God lied because he does not want her, her to have the wonderful blessings that results in the eating of the unforbidden, of the, the forbidden fruit. His statement to Eve clearly implies that an evil motive lies behind God's command. Satan told Eve that God is a selfish God. He is not really concerned for her welfare. As if he was saying, Eve, the reason God told you not to eat the fruit is not because eating the fruit will cause you to die. The real reason why God prohibited you to eat this fruit is that God is selfless. He doesn't want you to be like Him. And they believe that what would happen to them after they eat the fruit is that things would be, become wonderful. Things would become expansive and glorious. But when their eyes were opened, it was what? It was shameful. It was a disaster. And it was sad. <coughs> Eve took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband and her with her. And he ate. Listen, friends. Satan did not take the fruit and put it in his mouth. He can tempt, but he cannot force. Adam and Eve were totally responsible for their actions. Look at this. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and empties. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is grown, brings forth death. But the good news is, Although Adam and Eve failed miserably by eating the fruit and thus cast the human race into sin, death and misery, Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the covenant head of his people, suffered a massive assault to Satan under the severest circumstances, yet emerged the victim. Eve was tempted in lost paradise. Christ was tempted in a harsh barren wilderness. He was surrendered with the choices of fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables. She had food 
plenty of food and plenty of pure water. Jesus was tempted after fasting for 40 days. He was afflicted with hunger and pain. Eve, following Satan's lead, abandoned God's work. But Jesus Christ, when he was tempted, he said, It is written, it is written, it is written. Friends, when temptation arises, the scriptures must be in our hearts and our lips. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. My prayer this morning, friends, is that God will open our eyes and He will help us to see that the only place of refuge in times of temptation is no other than Jesus Christ Himself. That He alone can give us peace and joy. That He alone can give us victory over temptation. And that He may give us the heart that will continue to completely trust upon Him, to trust upon His grace and trust upon His love. This is my prayer. God bless you.
very sorry, Luca. We have failed you so many times. We're so weak. Father, thank you so much for your forgiving grace. Thank you so much, dear Lord, that you are giving us strength to overcome temptations that come in our lives. Help us, dear Lord, to always trust you. Help us to have confidence in your word. Help us, dear Lord, to stand firm because it is only in you where we can be able to overcome temptation. Father, thank you very much for cleansing us from all our unrighteousness. Thank you for being with us today, for this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.